Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, there's a story. Um, it's my favorite story of all time. It's a pretty dark story. Um, this is, I'm, I've lost my slides are very literal. It's called The Road. It's by a writer called Cormac McCarthy. And the story is about a father and a son, a, a man and a, and a boy, and they're making their way through what is a post-apocalyptic America. I read it a few years ago, and the story is not an easy story to read. It's one filled with devastating stuff. The landscape is gone, everything is gone. There are just a handful, or a few hundred handfuls of humans that are left. And these humans are pretty much, they are good or they are bad. And the differentiator is you are either eaten or you are not eaten. The story is beautifully written. It is astonishing in the way that it uh, exposes the journey that these two go on. And throughout the story, the, 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 the young son, I imagined him to be about eight or nine. He says to his father, Papa, are we carrying the fire? And the, and the father says to the son, yes, yes, we're carrying the fire. Now, on a very basic level, I understood what that meant. That meant, you know, they're, they're in the survival mode. They're going to go, get to where they're going to go. And they were aiming to get to the south, to the warmth, where they hoped they would find some kind of safety. The meaning of the fire, however, as literal as it is, has come to take um, on a completely different meaning for me. And I think that that's something that I want to talk about today with you. Um, meet my mum. Uh, this is the only selfie my mum ever had. So um, I think she was very proud of that, the fact that she only had one selfie. Um, five months after this picture was taken, my mum died. She was a remarkable woman um, in many different ways. Also flawed in many different ways, but that's the humans. That's the humans that we are. But my mum was, I think, astonishing because she had cancer four times in her life. The first three times were totally separate. Um, the final cancer that, that took her life back in August 2016 uh, was an echo of the very first one, some 16 years earlier. And for anyone who has had the privilege, and I do mean this, the privilege of being through somebody's journey when they are dying, it is a most profound experience. The, 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 the privilege that we had was that we were lucky enough to have mum uh, have home hospice care. And so we were able to give mum what I call a good death. The actual... A period, a period of time when death happens, when, sorry, when you are dying is, for many, it can be a, 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 a very long period, but death is momentary. Death is, is, is here, and it takes you, and you are gone. And when my mum died, late on August the 17th, 2016, the day before her birthday, um, we were there, my brothers were there, uh, our partners were there, and we had the privilege of being with her when her fire went. It didn't disappear altogether. And when you are with somebody when they die, you know they're, you know they're gone. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very strange thing, particularly when you're with somebody who has literally been in your life even before you were born. It is a profound experience, and it is one that I think for me, will stay with me obviously forever, but it has also changed the way I see things. However, it was not the first time that um, I'd experienced death. My father, here he is. Uh, I had to get this picture out of my father. He is in his very early 20s. This is in the 1950s, and I just think that he looks really super handsome. So I was like, I'm going to show this picture of dad. And the reason I love this picture of dad is because his life and hope and everything was about to stretch out before him. And that was the thing that really kind of like resonated with me when dad died. He died um, alone. He died in hospital. Uh, we, he was very ill. He, but the death actually came very quickly and, and, and surprisingly, I think. Um, and when he died, 
Um, my brother, my elder brother and I went to see him later that day in the chapel, um, uh, chapel of rest uh, in hospital. Again, he was there, but he was not there. He was dad, but it was not dad. The fire had gone, but the fire hadn't disappeared. Um, and this isn't going to sound like, you know, this is a wholly depressing story, by the way. But during this time, it does get a little bit worse. During this time, um, <laughs> I also had a startup. I had a tech startup. And it was the most um, incredible thing I'd done up to that point. And it was a total disaster. I failed catastrophically with it. I had the failure of the fact that people had invested in me, in the idea, in my passion, in my vision, and, I, and it failed. And it failed around the time. I couldn't do it anymore after Dad died. I was like, I cannot do this anymore. And then another thing happened. Um, a relationship that I'd been in for 12 years also failed around this time. There were seven weeks when my Dad died, the company went, and my, my partner of 12 years called it quits. Now, I played a role in every one of those bits. I felt the guilt, terrible guilt, for not being with my father when he died. I felt terrible, awful guilt that I had failed these people who'd put all that, all that hope and, and belief in me for this startup and trusted me, not only with their money, but trusted me with their hopes and aspirations. And also I had the terrible guilt that I had been party to the breakdown of a relationship that, at the time, I thought was going to be the rest of my life. So those three things are kind of like a tsunami of guilt and grief. And I don't think it's unsurprising, I span into quite a depression. Um, I couldn't even, I remember looking, I couldn't even look myself in the mirror some days. And um, I felt my fire, my fire in me was all but e extinguished. And then, um, for some reason, oh, that was my road, sorry, I said it was literal. This, I had my own personal road. Then something happened, I had what I call my escalator moment. So I was in London, um, I'd got a train, I was... Also, at this point, I was crying all the time. I just couldn't stop crying. I was crying, crying, crying. Got a train into London for some meeting, and I got on an escalator. And you know when you're in London and the etiquette is, you're supposed to stand to the right, and everyone else... I'm doing it for, for you, for the mirror image, and everyone else runs up, you know, to, to, the, to the left of you. So I was running, running, running. And um, I couldn't get any further, because this guy really selfishly, had stood right in the middle. And he was going neither, neither way. And I was just like, oh, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to stand here. I'm just going to stand here and wait. A couple of seconds after me just standing there, and obviously other people were just kind of like getting a little bit annoyed as well, this guy turned around. And he looked at me. And he went, Lizzie Hodgson. And um, <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I recognized him. I, I think our paths had crossed a few times with other work that I'd done, and he'd heard that my company had collapsed. And he said, what, what are you doing? What's going on? What's happening? And I couldn't really remember his name at the time, so I was like, oh, yeah, it's gone very, very wrong. And, but also, I, because I couldn't help, actually, the grief fell out of me then. And I told him about my father, and I told him about my, my ex-partner, and I, everything flowed out of me. And that was all happening just, you know, as we were going up the escalator. And, um, and I thought, oh, this, this you, are, I just, you sound weird. Stop now, you sound very strange, crying. Um, but I didn't, I didn't stop, and I kept going and just kept going. And at the top, he, he kind of like, we stood aside and he said, um, I was expecting him to go, um, really nice, see you later, thanks ever so much. Instead, he said, come and have a chat. And something inside me just went, I said, okay. I went and had a chat, and I'm not too clear on the timeline, but around two to three weeks later, I was working in the company that he worked for. They had given me an opportunity to find a purpose. They saw in me not somebody who was broken, not somebody who was utterly depressed and destroyed. Who, and when I went to work with them, I still couldn't stop crying. They saw in me somebody who deserved an opportunity to rise again. They also gave me something that has absolutely made me, um, to take me to this point here, to this very round red carpet that you've been watching all day. They gave me an event to run. It's a tiny little event. It was a monthly event. 
I brought people from the community together, and we talked about technology and arts and creativity and all of these amazing things. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with that process. I fell in love with the idea that people can come together and we can solve things. And I ran that for about a year or so. And then I came up with what I do now. I run an organization called Think Nation, and we humanize the impact of technology on young people. And the reason I do that is because I'm realizing that this fire that I had in me, I can pass on to other people. So the, the thing that we do at Think Nation has also um, opened my eyes to the fact that our fire is so precious. This fire we have in us is so precious. As I'm learning around the, the technology that young people here in the front row and all the young people I'm seeing, the Gen Zs, the stuff that they're inheriting, this is the world that we have created. And what's not happening, though, is that we're not talking enough about that technology that they're inheriting. And in particular, the one thing that has come out in all of our stuff that we do, and we try and empower young people to come up with tech solutions to the problems that they're inheriting, that we have created. One of the things that is coming more apparent is the impact of artificial intelligence in our lives. Now, we all know that artificial intelligence, you probably you know, have general kind of ideas of it, what it does. It's in your phone, it's in everything that we're doing, and it's going to become synonymous to everything we're doing. But one of the things about artificial intelligence is that it's written by a very, very, very narrow group of people. And artificial intelligence is almost going to become our replicant fire. And the reason I'm saying that is that if we are allowing organizations to design solutions that are in the view of a very narrow few, we are going to be perpetuating inequality. We're going to be perpetuating the divisions of societies, and we're going to be perpetuating the problems that we've got now, but we're going to be hardwiring them. And so one of the things that I think we need to be doing is this fire that we have in us, the fire that I know that every single one of us has here, We've got to kind of like turn that on its head a bit and say, are we scrutinizing the world that we have created and the young people inheriting? And the other thing I want to say about this is that the young people I've been working with, and they range between 14 and 24, I have never, ever been more excited and full of hope than the generation that are coming up behind us. It is astonishing what they want to do with this world. And we should, be, we should be encouraging them and engaging them in that conversation. These conversations are not happening in schools. They are not always happening at home. And they're certainly not happening in peer groups. But the world they are going into is going to be something that can be magnificent. And it is our responsibility to ensure that we are giving them the right tracks forward. And that does start by questioning the technology. That does start by saying, should we be just opening ourselves up to this data stuff? It does make us question, what is tech for? I'm an advocate of tech for good. And I think that the way that we've been going in the previous generations, and I'm, I think I'm Gen, Gen, Gen X. I'm Gen X. We are responsible for this. We're responsible for these kind of like ideas that we, we're creating. Now, what if we were to start saying we want to have these conversations in more open ways with young people? What if we were to say, why don't we kind of like start to think, are we getting the AI ethics right? Tech is neither good nor bad. It is what we do with it that actually makes the difference. So one of the things that I've learned through the fact that this fire that we have inside us, the fire that kind of like burns in young people that I'm, that I'm meeting, is that we have got to nurture it. We don't want AI to be our replicant fire. I don't want my life to be AI'd away. If I had my life so perfectly streamlined with all technology, I would never have had the bumps and the scrapes and seen the things that I've seen and experienced the humanity that I've experienced and experienced the terrible things as well. This is what makes us human. It is our humanity that brings us together. It is our experiences that matter, and that cannot be wrapped up in an app. I'm not a Luddite. 
I fundamentally believe in the power of technology, but we've got to start that conversation. And my message to you today is probably this. In fact, it is this. <laughs> Embrace the mess. Embrace the messiness of your lives. Embrace the fact that you don't know what's going to happen. Embrace the fact that you can't iCal your life away. Embrace those random moments. Do not miss your escalator moment. Look up, communicate, put humanity at the heart of everything we're doing. Because every single one of us has that here. Just put your hand there. You know what I'm talking about. That burn, that passion, you know what it is. Take that, move forward. I think I've got a last slide, because we're not binary. The world is not binary. We are not made of what for ones and zeros. Keep questioning, keep challenging, and be human.